I know, right? That's the way it is. As bad as it can get. It's suffering. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see each and one of you here at uh, church this morning. Uh, got a thank you card here to read from the Monticello Church family for your gracious words of. Uh,
joining us online, uh, just to my right, sitting in the front row, are Paul, uh, Red, and Ben. So Ben, you're the responsible adult today. Okay? So if they get out of line, I'm going to look at you, I'm going to give you the nod, you got to take them out. All right? All right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I take Paul's stick and you just thump him. It'd be all right. That reminds me, when I was a kid, there were four of us sitting in a pew, and we were sitting in front of Sister Norma. Uh, Sister Norma was 110 when I was born, so she was like 910 at this point. And we were acting a fool during church, and uh, we were about to use coffee stirrers and pieces of bulletin to shoot spit wads. And Sister Norma took her cane and went, boom, 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 right down the back of all four of our heads. And uh, instructed us in righteousness. That was not the only time she did that in my life either. But uh, uh, so you can use that stick. Just go across the back of their heads. It'll work. So I want to uh, to invite you to turn with me to Habakkuk today, chapter three. So we continue on in our in our idea of threads connecting the Old Testament to the New Testament, pointing to the fact that the gospel has always been God's plan from the beginning, and uh, and it has been all the way through. Uh, I want to invite you to uh, to just pause with me for a moment. We're going to have some prayer. Uh, Tony uh, said that Renee will be starting a weekly chemo starting this week, so he asked for prayer for her. Uh, that will be very taxing. We want to continue to remember Heidi um, as she started new chemo, and we want to continue to remember her. And then we want to remember Darlene. Uh, that would be uh, Uncafer's sister. Um, so she has surgery tomorrow. We want to remember her, and then uh, Matt Eusler, we want to remember him. He has uh, surgery and heart cap upcoming. So uh, just a couple of prayer concerns there, but we want to, want to invite you just to join me this morning as we pray and ask God to be with those. So let's pray together. Father, we are grateful to be here in your house, and uh, as the weather outside is nasty, uh, it, is, it is so, we are so blessed to have a place to come and to gather, and yet we know that our brothers and sisters around the world today uh, don't enjoy that same freedom. And so, Father, we pray for the persecuted church, for those who, because of your name's sake, have been shunned by their families, have been forced out of their homes, have been mistreated and lied about. And so, Father, we ask that you would just draw them close to you. May they know your presence and your peace. Father, we have... Many requests on our hearts. Uh, we think this morning of Jan as she continues to recover. Father, we pray that you give wisdom there. We pray for Darlene as she goes for surgery tomorrow. Guide the doctors. Help her recovery to be quick. We pray for Matt. God, just pray that you would continue to give the doctors a clear action plan there and, and guide them. We pray for Heidi as she continues in her treatment. Renee as she as well. Father, you know each one of them and each circumstance personally. Father, we, we pray that you would meet them and that you would protect them. Father, we pray that you would give wisdom and give peace. Lord, we know that there are many who have been affected uh, by COVID and by the things going on in our world. So, Father, we just ask that you would be with them. God, we're trusting you. And, and sometimes it is hard to see your hand in things. And so, God, we're going to trust your heart. So guide and direct us, and then give us the faith to be obedient as you do. God, we love you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Habakkuk, chapter 3. Uh, Habakkuk is not a very common book, as we have been now in these minor prophets over the last few weeks. Uh, they have been books that we probably haven't spent a lot of time in. Habakkuk is a, 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 an isolated and different book than any other book as the minor prophets go. As we've read through the Minor Prophets, we saw Jonah was given direction to go and tell Nineveh that, that God was going to, uh, to be sending judgment. We see that as we go throughout these Minor Prophets, through Obadiah and Micah. We see that that's a, a warning thing. Habakkuk is the one book where we don't see he as a prophet go and tell other people. It's one of the few times that we see in Scripture where there is just kind of a dialogue between God and his prophet. Habakkuk very much laments to God about the coming judgment. God has revealed to Habakkuk that, that Babylon is going to be used to judge the nation of Israel. 
because they have become godless. And he says, we're going to send the Babylonians in. They're going to conquer you. You're going to go into exile. We know that story. We know that that's where uh, so many difficulties came for the nation of Israel. But as that happens, Habakkuk laments to God and says, God, this is what I see coming. Why are you going to allow that to happen? And much like the psalmist would, as David wrote many psalms of lament, that God, my enemies are around me, or my foes are encamped near me, or why have you deserted me? In the midst of that, then he responds with the faithfulness of God. You know, I often wonder if someone was writing a book of the Bible to the church in America today, what would it look like? What would it sound like? Would it be a book of commendation? A book of, hey, you guys are really killing it. You are knocking it out of the park in what we're doing. Would it be a book of judgment? A book that would say, you have allowed sin to merge with righteousness and you have tried to make a, a mixture of things that has just muddied the waters. Would it be a book of, hey, keep the faith. Or would it be a mixture of all of them? And I would venture to say that it would probably be a mixture of all of them. In the world that we live in, I've had, I've had many questions this week about, you know, the, what's going to happen if there's another shutdown? And what are we going to do with church? And, and what's that going to look like? And, and how are we going to move forward? And, and my response to that has been, we're going to trust the faithfulness of God to march before us. Because if I try and figure out what's going to happen tomorrow... The Proverbs reminds me that man makes plans and God does what? He directs his steps. I can have all kinds of plans. I can have every plan in the world of every contingency of things that are going to go right and perfect and that's the way it's going to be. And in a moment, those can change. We, uh, we had Abe this weekend. Uh, we, we got the opportunity to have him stay with us. Went to get him Friday night. Had all kinds of plans for Friday night. Elise and Steve were going to come out. We were going to play some games. Uh, we were going to have tacos. We were going to do all this kind of stuff. On our way back, uh, Abe's kind of getting quiet in the back seat. And uh, I said, okay, if you want to just rest a little bit, that's okay. No, I'm not tired. I'm not tired. Okay. Jen said, Abe, buddy, if you want to take a little nap, it's okay. Go ahead and take a nap. You can, you can crash while we're in the car, and then when we get to the house, you'll be awake. No, I'm fine. About three minutes later from the back seat, we hear, and he's gone. So we get to the house. He's slept now about 20 minutes, and I'm like, okay, good. Power nap. He's going to be awake. We're going to have fun. Try to wake him up. He doesn't want to wake up. Get him to the front door. He walks through the front door, past Susanna, doesn't say hi, past Caleb, doesn't say hi, goes over to the chair, curls up, and he's asleep again. So I went in and I said, hey, buddy, we're going to, Aunt E and Steve, Uncle Steve are coming and we're going to play games. We're going to do this. And, and, and look, Pappy's got all these plans. I want to go to bed. Okay. So I took him in, got him ready, turned on some, some cartoons for him to watch to fall asleep to. And he sat up in bed. And he said, no, I don't want to go to bed. I don't want to go to bed yet. I, I want to stay up. I said, that's fine. You, you know at Pappy's house, we don't have bedtimes, Right. You can have all the sugar you want. You can, you can have no bedtimes. We party here because this is the fun zone. Okay, I, I'm going to stay up. I said, okay, you can get up. And he starts to crawl out of bed, and he said, no, I don't. And he flipped over, and within two minutes, he was gone. Slept 12 and a half hours. He was exhausted. I had all kinds of plans. I had, I had great plans. They were foiled by a six-year-old. This six-year-old destroyed everything that we had. Every, every, every plan that we had set up for the evening. Done by a six-year-old. And yet we sometimes, I sometimes, as a follower of Jesus, try and figure out what God's mind would be for tomorrow. And when I try and make those plans, it's real difficult. And we find here in, in Habakkuk, as he is crying out to God, and he's having this moment where he says, God, I don't like this plan. And he says, I don't like what's coming. I don't like the way that it is working out. I don't like the fact that things are going on the way they are. I don't like the fact that you've said this is the next step. I don't like any of that. He has a moment. And his moment is beautiful. 
And my challenge today is that I believe that this is the moment that you and I, especially you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ that live in America, this is, needs to be our prayer. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, let me read it. It says this, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigonoth. Here's the prayer. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. And in wrath, remember mercy. I want to break down that verse, especially verse 2 today, as to how you and I should pray that. Because I believe that we are at an unprecedented time in our nation that the church needs to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray because we need to seek God's face, first of all, in repentance. We need to pray because we need to seek God's direction for tomorrow. And we need to pray at how God would call us to live in light of the events of our world. Notice how he starts off, Lord. Notice that his focus is in the right place. Uh, how many of you are easily distracted? I'm that guy, right? I'm an easily distracted individual. Uh, I, I have told you before I had ADD and ADHD before it had letters and before it was normal. Um, I, I just was that kid. Being an Atkins in school, you know, we used to have CD charts. They always went alphabetically. They would have thought that I wouldn't talk because I was always in the front corner of the room by the teacher's desk. Andrew Atkins, two A's, you get stuck up front. I would talk to the teacher. I would talk to the kids sitting next to me. I would talk to the janitor who was in the hallway. I would talk to myself. And if there was no one to talk to, I would whistle or I would tap my pen or, man, I just, I am just not somebody who sits still well. That doesn't, that doesn't fit me well. I have a lot of friends who hunt and, and they'll say, man, you know, one of my favorite things about hunting is you're just out and there's nothing else and you're still and you're quiet. And I love to hunt. But if you were to walk up behind me while I'm hunting, you would generally find that I'm probably on my phone and I always have an earbud in and I'm listening to stories at the same time while I'm hunting. And for me, that is totally relaxing. I, I am that kind of guy. My focus is so easily switched because it is so easy for me to focus on what it is going on right now in the big What's the big noise? What's the, what's, the, what's the thing going on? You know, I shared with you a few weeks ago about not driving where you're looking. The other night as we were coming home, there have been some searchlights uh, over here in the Lima area. I don't know what they're running them for, but you know the giant lightsaber searchlights in the sky at night? Caleb and I have been so distracted by those things. We were coming home on 30, and he's like, I wonder where those are. Can we go find them? we got to see them. What are they doing? Why are they up there? And I'm like, nobody, we gotta get home, we got things we gotta do. And, and then the whole time that I'm driving, I'm trying to figure it out. Where are they at? Are they on a timer? Is somebody manually moving those? Are those on a switch because they're crossing at different times in different places? They're not moving this way, they're only moving. Th I was totally distracted. Here, Habakkuk has this moment. He knows that God has proclaimed judgment against Israel. It would be so easy for him to be distracted by. We've got to fortify the walls. We've got to get our spears ready. We've got to make sure we've got enough arrows. We've got to build a plan. We've got to be prepared. It would be so easy for him to do that, but he stops and he says, Lord, let me put my focus in the right place. Can I tell you something? As a nation, our focus has been whack for a long time. It just has. We have lost the reality of being a nation under God. Oh, we like the blessing of that. We want to be a nation blessed by God, which I believe that we are. But what does it mean to be a nation under God? To be under someone, what does that mean? What does it mean to have someone who is over you in authority? Does that mean you can disregard what they say? Does that mean that you can just ignore it unless it works for you? Does that mean you only reach out to them when things are difficult or hard? No. 
Our founding fathers understood that they submitted to an authority that was greater than themselves. While the Constitution is a phenomenal document, they understood that that, that document was subject to the truth of the Word of God. And oh, we pay with money that says we're under God, and we talk about being a nation under God, but have we really lived it? Because the Bible says that if we're living under God, the people will know that by the way that we love one another. The Bible says that we are called to care for those who can't care for themselves. The Bible says that you and I are to esteem the lowly, not give honor to the rich. The Bible says that we are to turn the other cheek. Have we seen a lot of that in the last few months or years in our country? I would argue no. And so as Habakkuk comes, he says, Lord, I'm submitting to the fact that you are God. You're the one who, who is and was and always will be. And that one word, he puts his focus in the right place. And then he goes on. He says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I've heard of your fame. You know, one of the greatest tragedies as Christians is that we don't talk about the greatness of God. We don't talk about the things that God has done. Can I tell you something? I have had the privilege of seeing miraculous things happen. I've had the privilege of seeing people healed. I've had the privilege of seeing prayers answered. I've had the privilege of seeing times where to the penny God has met needs. And how often do we talk about those things? How often do we walk up to somebody and we say, you know what really just has blessed my socks off? That four years ago, I prayed and God met that need. How often do we talk about his fame? As, as we read, uh, one of the things that I love to read is the voice of the martyrs. And to hear about the faithfulness of God to his people around the world. And if you want to read some encouraging and exciting things, go online and Google what God is doing in closed countries around the world. The visions and dreams that he is giving people. The reality that people are coming to know Jesus in droves of ways because God is reaching out to them. And, and he is speaking into their hearts. The story of the imam that standing on a street corner and as a blue car drives by, he stops and he's pounding on the window of this car. And the guy is terrified inside because he's a secret believer. And he says, this is it. They found me out. And he rolls down the window and the imam says, you believe in Jesus Christ. And the man driving looks at him and says, this is it. This is, this is where I die. And he says, yes, I do. He said, I, I need to get in. You need to tell me how to know him too. Because in a dream, he appeared to me and said that I needed to be here today and I needed to stop a blue car and I needed to ask them how to know Jesus. And you say, Andrew, that's weird. No, that's God. That's who he is. That's a God that is growing the church in closed countries like North Korea. That is a God that is growing the underground church in China by leaps and bounds. That is a God that is taking what people would say is impossible and saying, this is what I'm going to do. That is a God that because of COVID gave churches all across our country the opportunity to reach into homes that we would have never reached before. Do I like it? No. <laughs> Was not my plan. I had someone ask me recently, what did your church do? During COVID. And, and, and I thought about that. Man, we, we did a lot of stuff. None of it was planned. When we closed out December last year, and I filled out my little board report, my little report to go to the denomination, and it says, set three goals for this upcoming year. Guess what? Hosting drive-in church, drive-through prayer, online stuff, none of that was on there. None of that was on my plan list. And yet by the faithfulness of God, we have had the opportunity to do that. He says, Lord, I've, I've heard of your fame. Man, you are amazing, God. 
Yeah, things seem crazy. Yeah, there are times I'm like, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know what this is going to be. I don't, know, I don't know what step to take. God leads. He says, because I've heard of it, I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. We talked a little bit about this during Bible study on Thursday night, this idea of reverence. And I shared then that one of the things in my life that I saw that took my breath away, if you've ever had an experience where you've seen something that just is so beautiful that it takes your breath away, was we were out in Colorado and got to see the, the Red Rocks and the, the Garden of the Gods area. And, and you, you look at that and you look with mountains in the backdrop and it's 70 degrees where you're standing and there's snow on the mountain and the beauty of it. That you just can't describe. You just, you just can't put into words. Except to say, wow, look what God did. I, I've often wondered, you know, part of Adam's responsibility in the garden was to name the animals, right? I often wonder, which animal just really knocked his socks off? You know, as they came up to him, which one was it that he was like, Wow! What is that? I mean, think about just the difference of horses in the types and the colors, and then all of a sudden a zebra shows up. Think about the fact that all day you've been naming, you know, dash hounds and and uh, little yorkies and tiny poodle dogs, and you've been naming all these, and then all of a sudden a giraffe comes around the corner. And I wonder how many times throughout the day Adam had to stop and say, wow, look at that. that's amazing. Are you kidding me? I mean, the neck on that thing's like seven feet, and it's got a purple tongue. How cool is that? I can't wait till God gets here this evening because I want to I talk to him about that one. Wow. When was the last time we stood in awe of what God does? Because we've talked about it. We've said, God, I can't believe what you have done. This is amazing. Habakkuk is having that moment. Where out of nowhere, the greatness of God just overwhelms him. He says, I stand in all of your deeds, Lord. Notice that he comes back to make sure where he's at is where he's supposed to be. And then he makes a request. He says, repeat them in our day. Can I tell you that this phrase has been the most convicting portion of this scripture as I've prepared for this message over the last few weeks? Because it's very easy for me to look at our country and think that it may be too late. It's very easy for me to look at where things are in our world and say, oh my. There's probably nothing but judgment coming. And yet is God faithful enough that he could do it again? Could he do it again? Could he be the one that would say, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead them in repentance. I'm going to restore them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have them walk in righteousness again. How many times did he get to do that for the Israelite people? How many times? Did they go through judgment? Absolutely. Uh, this book of Habakkuk is written in the last ten years of the southern kingdom. Ten years from the time that Habakkuk writes this book, Babylon comes in and they take Israel into captivity. Ten years. And yet in the midst of that, God is still faithful. What does God do while they're in captivity? He raises up a Daniel and a Shadrach, and a Meshach, and a Bendigo. He sets men and women apart. He prepares a Nehemiah to go back to build walls. He's still moving. And as I, as I prepared for this message, I found myself saying, God, you can repeat them in our day. You can repeat this. God, you can. Forgive me for not believing that. God, I trust you with my eternity, but it's really hard to trust you with tomorrow. So God, repeat them in our day. Habakkuk cries out. 
He says, in our time, make them known. God, show off. God, show off. Do it. We, uh, we don't very often, I don't very often, pray asking God to show off. And yet I should. Do you believe that God spoke the world into existence? I do. Do you believe that God sent his one and only son upon the, this earth to die on the cross for our sins, was buried, rose again victorious over sin, and ascended into heaven? I do. Do you believe that God will come again and set all things to right? I do. Do you believe that because of Jesus, when you close your eyes in death and you have a personal relationship with him, you will spend eternity in a place of perfection where there is no sickness, no death, no disease, no separation, no darkness, no night, no medicine, no pain, no suffering? I do. When we pray, we pray like we're talking to a God that can do all that. And I have to say, I don't. Because sometimes I think, Lord, there is no hope here. Lord, the situation, I don't see it turning well. Lord, I, I'm not sure. And yet we serve a God who can and will and does. As we watched um, our governor's uh, press conference this week, when it was over, we were talking about what do you think is going to happen. My phone started blowing up and what's coming, what do you think, what do you know. And man, I had all kinds of opinions on that. What do I think is coming? Is there going to be another shutdown? What's, what are the cases? What are we looking at? What's going to happen? I've got a ton of opinions. A ton of opinions. And yet... As I went to bed that night, I had to confess that I didn't stop before I, I even discussed that at all and say, God, just do whatever you're going to do, because that's best. Man, that's hard for me to swallow. I'm a planner. If you saw Friarside last night, you saw the guy like to be prepared. That's me. That was not an act. I have tactical bacon in my house. Canned bacon so that when the world collapses, I can still have bacon. Because that's important. That's me. It is so easy for me to say, that's me. And yet, let me tell you something. If I was in charge of things, we would be in a far deeper mess than we are currently. So when I pray, it should be praying, talking to a God who knows everything, is all-powerful, is all-present, and says, my perfect will is best. And my prayer should be, okay, God, then your will be done. On earth, as it is in heaven. Because if where I want to go is heaven, because heaven is perfect, then why would I not want the guy who's in charge in heaven to be on charge on earth? He says, do it in our day. Make, in our time, make them known. And then here is the plea. In your wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk knows that the wrath of the Babylonians is coming. God has already told him that. God has already looked at that and said, judgment is coming. And yet Habakkuk says, God, I know wrath is coming, but in that, please still be merciful. If you've read through the book of Revelation, it is a book that is terrifying at times. 
some of the things uh, that, that go on. Misty this morning showed us a picture of, uh, uh, of a, was a scorpion wasp or scorpion hornet, something. And flying scorpion, it, it's this big, huge bug that's down in Texas that has, you know, this ugly face and nasty wings, looks like a giant hornet, but it's got a big hook tail that's like a scorpion, and that's how it stings you. And she said, isn't this mentioned in the book of Revelation? Because it is. The Bible says in Revelation that there's a point in time where the earth opens up and these creatures fly out of it. They have hair like a woman and, and a face like a man and a tail like a scorpion. And they go around and they sting everybody and make people wish that they were dead. And, and Revelation talks about that, you know, the, the grass is going to dry up and the waters are going to become bitter. And, and, and all of these things are going to happen. And it is a terrifying time. And yet, let me tell you something. The truth of the book of Revelation is that every single thing that happens is to point people back to the truth that Jesus loves them enough that he wants a relationship with him. And even in the midst of the darkness and the judgment, he sends out 144,000 evangelists that are Jewish by birth who will walk through fire and they will proclaim the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. And thousands and millions of people will turn to him and say, that's the one. We have missed it, but now we've looked upon him. We've been saved. And because of that, we now see the graciousness of God even as the world burns. Because in judgment, God remembers mercy. And there is not a single person here today, in this room, online, or who will watch this later, that has not experienced judgment tempered with mercy. Period. Because the Bible says that we were all sinners. By birth. Born sinful people. And that the wages of that, the payment for that sin is death. That death is not only physical, but it is eternal. It is a separation in hell, an eternal judgment apart from God. And that was the judgment that was coming. That was the wrath that we deserved. But while the wages of that are, are death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. God, even though we deserve wrath, sent his son to proclaim mercy. And because of the cross, we don't have to go through the death any longer. Because of the cross, heaven is secure. Because of the cross, you and I have had the opportunity to understand the truth of wrath but mercy. Can I tell you something? I don't deserve mercy. I don't. I fail. Fall short. Struggle to be obedient. Struggle with focus. Struggle with those things. I don't deserve it. If you're honest, you would be saying, I agree with you, Andrew. I don't either. And yet the mercy of God is that he offers it to us. Freely and fully, redemptively through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? As we pray this prayer for our nation, it is really hard to pray in wrath, remember mercy. Because we are... I am a person, and I think some, probably many of us are wired, that sometimes it's gratifying to see people get what they deserve. It's, it's gratifying to see somebody get what they had coming to them. And yet we don't want to live that way. Because we don't want it. I've shared with you that when I drive, that is a test of my spiritual walk. This week I was driving. I went to pull out of a parking lot and to go, I was, gonna, I was turning to the right. And as I pulled out of the parking lot, I didn't see the car coming. I just didn't see him. I don't know why I didn't see him. I looked. 
I wasn't texting. I wasn't playing with the radio. I was, it was clear out. I, I don't know why I didn't see him. But I pulled out. And all of a sudden, I hear the horn, right? The horn that I have given in my life. And I look in my rearview mirror and I see this car getting on the woe real quick. And its front end is dipping down because it's really putting them on. And so I hit the gas trying to get out ahead of them. And by the grace of God, they we didn't crash. It was close. But they came up beside me. And I wish I could say I've never done this to somebody. But they came up beside me and the guy took his sunglasses off because he wanted to make sure that I could see his eyes, right? You know, you know the stare that you're given, that you've given and that you get? And he gives me the look, the look. The I'm watching his blood pressure tick up look. And I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm trying to word it really big, you know, make it, I'm sorry, sorry. And he's mad. I mean, he is just mad. And before he takes off, he indicates through sign language what he thinks of me. And I, man, I'm sorry. And as I'm driving home, I'm thinking, man, that guy was a real jerk. What a jerk. I mean, I didn't see him. It was an accident. I, I, I said I was sorry. And whether it was through WBCL or whether, and maybe you heard it on the radio, God saying directly to Andrew, this is a station break for Andrew, or whether it was in my head or whether it was just in my heart, it was almost as clear as an audible voice where God said, how many times? Have you? And so, Andrew, in wrath, remember mercy. Because you didn't like being judged by the standard that you held somebody else to. Can I tell you what our nation needs today is mercy. It needs mercy. Our nation, more than anything else, more than clarity in an election, more than cure for coronavirus more than financial independence, wealth, oil independence. What our nation needs to experience today is the understanding of the mercy of God and to experience that in a personal and powerful way so that then we would be a changed people. And so as Habakkuk prays this, he says, God, please, please send mercy. so I've been challenged that when I hear a news report that makes me mad, and let me tell you something, there are a lot of those that I stop and I pray, God, please make your mercy clear to them. That when I see a Facebook post from a friend from college that is so anti what he and I sat in a college lounge and talked about, I stop and say, God, please let him experience your mercy. Man, that's hard. But that's what's offered to us. Do you know that on the right hand of the Father this morning sits Jesus? And for every moment that we have messed up, every sin, every thought, every action, every word that we have spoken that has been against God's law and his desire, Jesus on the right hand of the Father says, Father, let them experience mercy. Let them experience mercy. Because, because I offer grace to them, Father, and so you can withhold your judgment because they, they get mercy. It's hard. It's a hard message. Uh, 
It's, it's hard in the world that we live in. Because it's, it's easy. It's easy to point to others that be judged. It's hard to look at them and say that they need mercy. I will tell you that I had an experience with this that I'm still wrestling through. And it takes a direct act of only choosing to be obedient to pray for mercy in the circumstance. I'm not doing it because I want to, because I don't. I'm not doing it because it's easy, because it's not. But I'm striving to do it because it is obedient. Because it is what I would want someone to do for me. We're going to take communion today. Communion is a picture of mercy. It was what Jesus was offering at the table that night. We do this to remember the Last Supper, and as we do that, this was a time where Jesus offers it to a group of guys that are going to bail on him. Peter's going to deny him. Thomas is going to doubt him. The others are going to flee. Judas is going to betray him. And what does he offer at the table? Mercy. He says, this is my body. This is my blood. It will be given for you. It's not about the way that we do things. This is about the heart of the message of the gospel. If you're joining us at home or you just don't feel comfortable taking communion here, that's okay. You can do communion in a lot of different ways. I, I, I was thinking through, I took uh, a picture and put it on Facebook and, and I have done communion. Um, probably the strangest communion elements that I've used was a Nutter Butter and some Yoo-Hoo. I was walking through the nursing home and a lady said, Pastor Andrew, and I said, yeah, she said, I have rededicated my heart to Jesus and I desperately want to do communion. And I said, that's great. Let me go home. I'll get my kit. I've got a neat little travel box. It's got a little juice bottle. It's got a little tub for the wafers, little silver plates. She said, no, 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 no. I'm old. And I said, okay, I know that. <laughs> She said, I could be dead by the time you get back. I said, are you sick? Well, no, but I'm old. Okay. She said, I saved some yuhu and a nutter butter from lunch. Will you do communion with me right here, right now? It was one of the most beautiful communion services that I've ever been a part of. Because it had nothing to do with the elements in the way. It had everything to do with the heart that understood the redemptive mercy of a gracious God and wanted to celebrate that at the table. And so if you're joining us from home and you have crackers and juice or you have tortilla chips and pop and you want to celebrate communion with us, today it is about the heart of Jesus. Where you're sitting here in the auditorium, if you'll look at the end of your pews, you will find these small Individually held communion cups. Uh, Andy, if you'll grab one out of that second row for the boys here in the front for me. We're going to take communion. We're going to enjoy this together, and yet we need to remember that the table is extended. The table is extended to the point where this is not about what you eat and drink. This is about why. And so we're going to take the wafer, which you just peel the top layer back. That's the wafer. We'll take that. We'll take it together. We'll open the cup. We'll take that together. But in this time, I want this to be a moment where we as a community here and wherever we are, thank God for his mercy. So as you open it up. You can take the wafer.
And Jesus sitting around the table that night takes, takes a loaf of bread. And it was unleavened bread. It would have been what like we would consider today matzah. A very stiff and hard cracker. And he would take it and he would break it. And it would make a cracking sound. He would say, this is my body that I'm going to give for you. And he did that intentionally because the sound soon that he would face would be the sound of the whip. And the breaking of that against his skin. And he did it because he was offering mercy. And he did it because he was willing to sacrifice himself physically for you and for me. So as you take of the bread, remember his physical sacrifice for us. You can take of the bread. thank you for the gift of your body which was broken for us your word tells us that you were beaten you were hit, that you were whipped you were mocked a crown of thorns placed on your head spit upon your word tells us that you did that because you love us that while we were still sinners while we were your enemy you showed us mercy. We only deserve judgment and your grace. Your grace was what was poured out. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for your mercy. If you take the cup, you open it up. As he would have been sitting at the table, he would have had a cup. It would have been one cup. And he would have passed it around to everybody at the table. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. They knew what they were talking about. The, the celebration they were there for was Passover. Passover was the, the celebration of putting the blood of a lamb over the door to save the firstborn in Egypt. That's what they were celebrating. They were celebrating the loss of the life of a lamb. And Jesus says, I'll become the lamb. And I'll take away the old covenant. It's no longer about rules and, and regulations. It's now about relationship. And I'll show you mercy, even though you don't deserve it. And there were people who sat there and they looked at the cup and they had the option of mercy. And yet he chose to still betray him. The amazing part is Jesus didn't say it's for everybody except for the one. He said it's offered to y'all. So in those times in my life, when I've looked grace in the face and said, I'm going to do it on my own. I'm so thankful for his mercy that he still passes me the cup. But he still says, here, drink and eat. Be at my table. He would give his blood. They wouldn't take it from him. Even the thief on the cross knew that he could call down legions of angels to rescue him in that moment. He gave it up. And he gave it for you and for me because of mercy. So just take the cup, thank him for the mercy of redemption. Father, thank you. Thank you for your body and for your blood. Thank you for the redemption of it. Thank you for the mercy that you gave in spite of our faith. 
failures and shortcomings. God, we love you. Help us to be people that beg for your mercy. Not only for us, but for each other. And for the world that we live in. Guide and direct us as we leave this place today. Help us to be safe, Father, in the weather. I pray that you would protect each one. And we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. You are dismissed. Don't forget board meeting upstairs, please. Well, you kept them in line, dude. Good job.